Mira, como podemos consolidar, consolidar el intercambio con las, el resto de las redes liberales de otras regiones. Iniciar con Celito Arlegue, director ejecutivo del Consejo de Liberales y Demócratas de Asia, tiene mucho sentido para Latinoamérica, para todos nosotros, por múltiples razones. Las que iremos viendo en el diálogo que sostendrán en un momento más. Entre ellas yo quisiera destacar solamente eh, la construcción de admirables sistemas democráticos, de un progreso económico que tiene décadas sorprendiéndonos, y la manera como enfrentan eh, los avances e influencia de China. Yo creo que eso es muy importante eh, en este momento para todo el mundo. Eh, China, la superpotencia que busca el liderazgo mundial, eh, se está convirtiendo en una amenaza real para la democracia en el mundo y especialmente en nuestro continente, donde ya tiene muchísima influencia. Eh, yo quiero agradecer a Silvia Mercado y a Brenda Rodríguez la organización de este evento y a Silito Arlegue, mucho, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros y a Sigi Herzog por haber aceptado también participar en este diálogo. Mil gracias. Muchas gracias, Berta, por, por tus palabras. Les recuerdo nuevamente que tenemos traducción simultánea y pueden elegir su idioma de preferencia en el globo terráqueo. Eh, ahora quiero darle la bienvenida a Celito Arlegue, eh, director ejecutivo de Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats desde el 2010. Eh, también quiero agregar a su CV eh, que entre su periodo en CALT ha impartido cursos de ciencias políticas, eh, ciencias sociales, economía en varias escuelas de Filipinas, como la Universidad de Filipinas Miriam College, la Universidad de Asia y el Pacífico San Bedna College y Universidad de La Salle. En la actualidad se desempeña también como profesor titular en el Departamento de Asuntos Consul Consulares y Diplomáticos de La Salle. Por otro lado, también es un gusto darle la bienvenida a Siegfried Herzog, director regional de la Fundación Friedrich Naumann para América Latina. Es economista de profesión, ha dirigido también las oficinas de la Fundación Friedrich Naumann en Manila, en la Oficina de Asia del Sur en Nueva Delhi, en la Oficina Regional de Asia Sudoriental y Oriental en Bangkok. Eh, uh -huh. Completó su maestría en Economía eh, con estudios del área de América del Norte en la Universidad de Ebhard Karls de Tübingen y fue uno de los fundadores de NETS EV, una ONG alemana que trabaja en el desarrollo de base en Blan Bangladesh. Eh, bienvenidos a ambos, es un placer tenerlos hoy con nosotros y sin más preámbulo, eh, les cedo a ambos el podio. Celito, por favor. Celito. Yes, as uh... Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I have to unmute myself. Uh, so good evening, buenas noches, uh, gracias uh, Brenda for the kind uh, introduction. And thank you so much uh, to Relial for the invitation to speak about uh, the state of liberalism and democracy in Asia, particularly in relation to uh, recent developments in uh, Hong Kong and uh, Myanmar. Uh, be before I proceed to my uh, presentation, uh, please uh, allow me to, short, to show a short video about the organization I represent, the Council of uh, Asian Liberals and Democrats, or CAL. Uh, this video is around uh, three minutes, and uh, it also has uh, Spanish uh, subtitles. So he here is the video.
Okay. Uh, so, so, so thank you so much for your attention. Okay. So, Lito, I think um, we can now uh, continue with your presentation. Um, I see. And you have um, you've brought a little presentation for us to structure your talk, um, yes. and then we'll uh, go. We'll discuss the two of us a bit about the situation, and afterwards we'll open the floor to the audience. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sigi. Um, let me just uh, start my presentation. Okay, uh, my, my apologies again for that. I can hear the audio, but uh, I did not know that you don't have an audio. Uh, but I can also share uh, a link to the video uh, uh, so that uh, you, you can uh, watch it at your own time. Uh, well, at, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, as what you can see in the video, CALD is uh, relatively a small network of political parties and uh, individuals in Asia. The size of the network, to a certain extent, uh, it uh, reflects the continuing uh, challenges to liberalism and democracy in uh, the region. And uh, actually this week, uh, we can see this... Uh, challenges in full view with developments in uh, Hong Kong, uh, Myanmar, and uh, Cambodia. So in Hong Kong, for example, last uh, Sunday, the Hong Kong police uh, arrested 47 pro-democracy activists, including 13 uh, former uh, legislators. They were uh, arrested under the national uh, security law and were, were charged uh, with conspiracy, conspiracy to commit uh, subversion. Uh, on the same day, the United, Human Ri the United Nations Human Rights Office reported that at least 18 people were killed in Myanmar. And uh, this is described as the most uh, violent crackdown by security forces since the February 1 uh, military coup d'etat. The following day, additional charges uh, were filed against uh, de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi. So for this reason, uh, there are some claims that uh, uh, these uh, additional charges may bar her political comeback. And then uh, on Monday, uh, March 1, a Phnom Penh court in Cambodia convicted the top nine uh, leaders of the Cambodia National Rescue Party. Uh, the charge against them was an attempt to organize a coup d'etat to overthrow the government. So all dependents face 20 to 25 year uh, imprisonment because of these uh, charges. So these three recent events uh, show the worsening state of freedom and democracy in, in Asia. So in my presentation tonight, I will attempt to uh, identify uh, the regional trends which uh, underpin this uh, democratic uh, backsliding. My main argument in this uh, presentation is that this uh, worrying uh, regional trends, one way or the other, are influenced by the region's hegemon, China. However, to portray China as having only negative democratic implications misses how China's increasing assertiveness also leads to the opposite dynamic, the, the galvanization of democratic forces in the region and even globally. So in order to prove this argument, I will divide my presentation into four parts. Okay, so the first part uh, puts into context uh, the state of uh, democracy in uh, Southeast and East uh, Asia. Uh, guided by this context, the second part uh, describes the recent regional trends that worsens uh, the state of democracy in the region. In the third part, I relate these regional trends to China's uh, geopolitical rise. And the fourth part, uh, drawing uh, from recent developments in Hong Kong and Myanmar, I will try to demonstrate how opposition to China has forged global regional solidarity and democratic pushback 
against authoritarian and illiberal forces in the region. Finally, I will end with some concluding remarks about uh, the prospects of democracy in Asia. Okay, so we all know that uh, democracy is in global uh, recession. U.S.-based non-governmental organization Freedom House uh, stated in its uh, Freedom of the World 2020 years from 2005 to 2019. All over the world, democratic institutions and processes are under attack from At best, some of these countries can be labeled as hybrid regimes or flawed democracies. As what you can see in this uh, particular table, only Timor-Leste is marked free, but uh, Timor-Leste is not yet a member of the Association of Southeast Asian uh, Nations. East Asia has a much better record when it comes to democracy. So Japan, South Korea, Taiwan rank as free even as uh, East Asia also includes two of the world's most intransigent authoritarian regimes, mainland China and North Korea. Some of you may ask, why is democracy in Southeast and East Asia not that strong to begin with? So there are many possible answers to this quest question ranging from history of colonization, weak institutions, widespread inequality to cultural explanations uh, emphasizing Asian values. These, however, are beyond the scope of my presentation, but we can discuss them later uh, during the open forum. Suffice it to say, the democratic weakness uh, of the region has been made worse by recent regional trends. And I would like to emphasize these trends. In a recent article, que pueden empeorarse con las tendencias regionales actuales. Entonces, identificamos tres tendencias regionales que han erosionado la democracia en Asia. Entonces, estas tendencias son la inequidad y la corrupción de las élites, la polarización nacional y el surgimiento del etnonacionalismo y un menor espacio para la sociedad civil. Pero a mí me gustaría agregar otras tres. La represión de la oposición política, también la diseminación de noticias falsas o, desinform o la desinformación y... Responses. So this above mentioned regional trends cannot be separated from the global geopolitical landscape. More specifically, it appears to me that the intractable internal problems of the world's most established democracies, particularly the United States, made them more preoccupied at home and less confident or willing to support democracy internationally, although this may be changing under the Biden uh, administration. On the other side of the spectrum, the leaders of the world's foremost authoritarian regime, China, emboldened by its consolidation of power domestically and enormous uh, economic clout, deployed sharp power to disrupt the politics of developed countries or its checkbook diplomacy to buy the loyalty of developing nations. The regional implication, at least for uh, Southeast and East Asia, is for authoritarian and authoritarian-leaning leaders to look up to China as a model that they could emulate. A stance which have been rewarded generously by China in terms of foreign aids and loans. As what 
what uh, Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping said. Préstamos, como lo dijo el presidente de China, uh, Xi Jinping, China está abriendo brecha a los países en desarrollo y esto ciertamente es en deterioro de la democracia. La institución Brookings en su reciente análisis dijo eh, que eh, con respecto a todas estas tendencias que la corrupción y la inequidad y el espacio restringido para las things influence has had a deleterious effect in its bid to normalize its governance model and cast doubts on the efficacy of democratic governance to deliver solutions china is once again making illiberalism a more que el liberalismo o que el antiliberalismo sea más aceptado en la región del Indo Pacífico y eh, vemos acá la ley, eh, cómo se aplica la ley en contra de la oposición política y este caso se puede observar bien en Hong Kong y parece venir de este mismo libreto autoritario que China también está exportando a otros países del sureste asiático y por lo que se refiere a la desinformación la evidencia que podemos ver de Taiwán y de las Filipinas sugiere que China también ha utilizado las noticias falsas de manera activa para poder configurar la política en estos países de acuerdo con las preferencias políticas de la propia China. Entonces la aportación de China a estas tendencias le da credibilidad a que el surgimiento de China tiene repercusiones negativas para la democracia y la libertad en Asia y también presumiblemente para otras regiones del mundo, incluida América Latina. Pero cuando yo comencé esta presentación, dije que el surgimiento de China y la mayor asertividad de China también ha resultado en la, gabal en, en, en la gabalización de las fuerzas democráticas a nivel nacional y regional. Y quisiera yo explicar mejor esto que les, que les digo, viendo cuáles son las, las respuestas democráticas a los desarrollos políticos, a los acontecimientos políticos recientes en Hong Kong y Myanmar. Yo digo que la reciente crisis política de Hong Kong se puede rastrear hasta el año 2012. En aquel año, Hong Kong intentó aprobar una reforma educativa donde se glorificaba los logros del de Partido Comunista Chino. Así que en 2014, esta oposición a la intrusión china llegó a su punto más alto con la famosa revolución de los paraguas. Y en 2016 eh, surgieron protestas de, de la revolución de los paraguas y hubo represión en contra de ellos, pero se, el descontento se pudo expresar en el resultado de las elecciones del Consejo Legislativo y esto apoyó a los activistas de el movi del movimiento de la revolución de, las, de los paraguas y después a otros activistas editores, periodistas fueron arrestados y expulsados de Hong Kong y se les prohibió la entrada. En 2019 se aprobó, o bueno, más bien se presentó una ley de extradición que esto permitiría que quienes estuvieran acusados de un delito en Hong Kong pudieran ser transferidos a China y esta es una nueva forma de reprimir las protestas. Y preocupados por estas protestas, China impuso la ley de seguridad. Which uh, punishes uh, secession, subversion, terrorism, and... uh, el terrorismo y la colusión con fuerzas extranjeras. Entonces, esta nueva ley, la ley de seguridad nacional, llegó, llevó a, la, a los uh, arrestos de grave escala de todos los activistas de la democracia en esta semana. Entonces, ahora quiero ir a Myanmar. Y con respecto a Myanmar, me gustaría concentrarme en los acontecimientos de, desde 2010, porque en 2010 la elección que fue administrada por los militares 
en, en aquel momento eh, el partido de Aung San Suu Kyi no participó, entonces no pudieron ganar esa elección en particular. Entonces, por lo por lógica, pues el resultado eh, eh, coincidía con las preferencias de los militares que habían gobernado el país desde los años 60 y después de eh, que es, habían asegurado este resultado, ya liberaron a, a Suchi que había estado en arresto domiciliario por casi dos décadas para ese entonces en el 2010 y después de que la liberaron del arresto domicili eh, domiciliario, el NLB participó en las elecciones de 2012 y en aquel entonces eh, 43 de los 44 curules pertenecieron a, al partido eh, de liberación nacional o de la de, de la democracia en 2000 15 también ganaron una gran victoria con casi el 80 por ciento de las curules que estaban en disputa. En 2017 vino la crisis de los Rohingya, que bueno, había comenzado antes, pero llegó a su punto más alto con casi eh, 7.300 personas cruzando la frontera de Bangladesh. Pero yo quisiera decirles que esta crisis de los Rohingya puso eh, en duda la reputación internacional de Suchi porque Suchi se rehusó a condenar las atrocidades que se estaban cometiendo en contra de los Rohingya e incluso fue a, a, al Tribunal Internacional de, de Justicia para defender las acciones de los militares. Pero aquí quisiera señalar que eh, eso, eh, que, que este problema de Suchi eh, con respecto a, a los Rohingya, eh, los ministerios de, de defensa eh, y estaban en manos de los militares. Entonces, bueno, entonces Suchi, no quiero decir que Suchi no, no tenga culpa hasta cierto punto por esta escala, por, este, por estos problemas, pero bueno, eso fue lo que ocurrió. En el 2020 hubo elecciones generales en noviembre pasado y el partido NLD Tuvo una victoria avasalladora con 396 de los 400 curules del Senado. En el 2015, NLD solamente tenía 390. Así es que estamos hablando de una gran victoria avasalladora en el 2020. Y este fue el punto principal que utilizó el, el gobierno militar en febrero, el primer el primero de febrero, ya que especificaron hubo fraude electoral en las elecciones del 2020, aunque estos argumentos en la comisión electoral obviamente fueron refutados. Entonces, bien, estos son los acontecimientos que podemos hacer referencia en Myanmar y Hong Kong. Veamos cuáles fueron las respuestas democráticas a partir de los acontecimientos más recientes. Permítanme identificar primeramente las respuestas mundiales. En parte, debido a la intransigencia china, debido a esa firmeza que ha mostrado China, y debo decirlo que China ha rehusado a condenar el golpe de estado en Myanmar. Cada vez más vemos más muestras de solidaridad entre países democráticos. Esa posibilidad de contrarrestar el autoritarianismo de China lo podemos ver en la propuesta de cambiar la cumbre del G7 a D10. Esta es una propuesta del primer ministro del Reino Unido, Boris Johnson. Entonces, iba a ser los países del G7 más Australia, India y Corea del Sur. En un informe reciente publicado por la OTAN, también se ve un énfasis marcado a la resiliencia democrática. 
además la cumbre de la democracia mundial, que fue una de las promesas de Joe Biden cuando estaba en campaña hacia la presidencia, y de hecho escuché que sí se va a llevar a cabo este año. Así es que a nivel mundial empezamos a ver este tipo de respuestas por parte de los países democráticos para enfrentarse al autoritarianismo que va increciendo. En Asia también quisiera llamar su atención a la alianza del té con leche que inició el año pasado, principalmente eh, en el, en el, durante el invierno, eh, en Twitter, en Twitter, en donde pues um, fue un movimiento transnacional entre activistas democráticos de países de Hong Kong y bueno, te escribo a Hong Kong como país de Vietnam, de Myanmar, de India, incluso de las Filipinas y Vietnam. Debido a las intrusiones chinas en el mar del sureste asiático, este movimiento tiene la intención de tener más democracia, más libertades en la región. Y están utilizando este, este hashtag, la alianza del té con leche, para compartir información, estrategias y mantener el mensaje vivo. Recuerdo muy bien que uno de los miembros, un ex legislador de Hong Kong, joven, nos dijo que cuando el autoritarianismo en otros países de Asia como Tailandia en ese momento nos decía está llegando a la cumbre y pues si los tailandeses no pueden hablar del tema, por las leyes les mayes, pues entonces nosotros en Hong Kong podemos hablar a nombre de nuestros con, de nuestras contrapartes en Tailandia. Así es que esta red de solidaridad internacional es notable y empezó en línea y se mantiene viva en línea. En términos de las respuestas nacionales, quisiera llamar su atención a las protestas amorfas que así se hacen llamar en Myanmar y en Hong Kong, estas protestas sin forma se hacen llamar que son como el agua, se agua, es decir, pueden cambiar, pueden fluir, pueden cambiar sus tácnicas instantáneamente. Esas protestas no se pueden especificar, no hay un líder marcado, se pueden organizar de manera instantánea. Estas estrategias principalmente están diseñadas para no ser arrestados a manos de la policía o de miembros del ejército. A, a mi parecer, las protestas en el sudeste asiático de Hong Kong hasta Tailandia y a Myanmar están aprendiendo entre sí en términos de cómo cambiar sus estrategias de protesta y de cómo hacer campaña. En Myanmar también quiero llamar su atención al movimiento de desobediencia civil, principalmente profesionistas de Myanmar como abogados, doctores, maestros, quienes están a la vanguardia de las protestas. Y es un movimiento ampliamente expandido en todo Myanmar. Y una de las características que podemos ver en las protestas de Myanmar es la escala nacional. Se pueden ver en todos los rincones de Myanmar. No están nada más concentrados en las áreas urbanas, sino que tenemos una condena expandida en contra del golpe de estado en todo el país. Además, también hay boicots y huelgas. Estaba escuchando el domingo pasado un activista en una, eh, en una reunión juvenil y ella nos decía que están a, eh, dirigiéndose a los negocios que están asociados con el gobierno militar para que hagan un boicot contra los productos que venden estos negocios. Y también hay un comité que representa al Parlamento Unitario de Myanmar. Son 17 parlamentarios del NLD y hacen actividades diplomáticas para llamar la atención de la comunidad internacional para que no reconozcan al gobierno militar. Incluso hicieron un intento eh, y están pensando a largo plazo 
quieren formar un gobierno paralelo. Lo leí ayer en las noticias. Acaban de nombrar a cuatro ministros para representar al gobierno NLD. Por supuesto, en este momento no, no existe. Así es que, si me lo permiten, daré paso al fin de mi presentación. Quiero compartir con ustedes algunas conclusiones y discúlpenme por tomar un poquito más del tiempo que me han asignado. Estas respuestas muestran que mientras hay retos a la democracia y a la libertad en Asia, hay atisbos de esperanza que nos pueden hacer sentir más optimistas hacia el futuro de la democracia y de la libertad en la región. Además, también quisiera resaltar que a pesar de las preocupaciones legítimas de la erosión de la democracia en Asia, es importante resaltar que Asia hoy por hoy es más democrática si comparamos al Asia de la, de, de la Guerra Fría. El Centro Pew en una investigación especificó que las seis democracias de Asia, Australia, India, Indonesia, Jap Japón, las Filipinas y Corea del Sur, los ciudadanos en estos países siguen mostrando altos niveles de apoyo hacia la democracia y cómo es que la democracia se manifiesta en su país. China sigue teniendo una sombra bastante extensa en la región y los retos que enfrenta la democracia pues son sombríos. Pero en un taller que organizó CALD en 2019, un, un taller para jóvenes, Chito Gascón habló de la Comisión de los Derechos Humanos, es quien dirige esta comisión y nos recordó la historia de el pedrero que talla una una piedra y citó a un reformista social estadounidense danés Jacob Rills dice cuando nada parece ayudar yo observo al, a quien talla la piedra que le pega a esa piedra que está tallando 100 veces pero al golpe 101 esa piedra se rompe en dos. Yo sabía que no era ese último golpe el que partió la piedra en dos, sino todos esos golpes que vinieron antes. De una manera muy similar, la situación de los derechos humanos y la democracia en Asia puede ser sombría, pero tenemos que resistir. Tenemos que seguir golpeando esta piedra, tal y como los pro quienes han protestado en Myanmar y en Hong Kong han hecho. Y un día, un día, esa aparente piedra impenetrable del autoritarianismo se va a romper y vamos a ver cómo florecen la democracia y la libertad en la región de Asia. Muchas gracias, Maramen Saramampo. Muchas gracias. Maramen Saramampo. Maramen Saramampo. Gracias. Creo que fue una muy comprensiva y muy impresiva. At the moment is especially, I would say, critical and worrying. I just saw today that one of my colleagues in Myanmar was seriously injured during the uh, during the protests yesterday. It seems the Myanmar uh, military is bent on um, tracking down with brutal force. So this is, I think, really something extremely worrying. Um, maybe you could. Um, to what extent has uh, have the regional neighbors, especially in the context of ASEAN, reacted mm. to the coup. Yeah, is, there some, is there some pressure from, from them? Because, because after all, they, do, they also do business with the Myanmar military. Th that's true, uh, uh, Sigi. And it's a good question, no? Um, uh, because many, ma many uh, countries, uh, particularly from the West, uh, are pushing ASEAN to do something. And ASEAN also recognizes that um, uh, this uh, particular uh, event in Myanmar damages their uh, credibility, uh, the credibility of the institution, uh, in particular the ASEAN. So, so they, they, they were also pressured to act. And there have been some movements, like, uh, for example, in the case of uh, Indonesia, 
uh, there was an attempt of uh, the Indonesian uh, foreign minister uh, to, to reach out uh, to, to Myanmar. And I, I heard that uh, there was even a, an attempt to visit Myanmar and meet with the uh, military leaders, although um, this uh, did not uh, push through and the meeting eventually took place in uh, uh, Thailand. Um, uh, but nothing concrete uh, came out uh, of, of the meeting. Uh, although the, uh, just last uh, Tuesday, there was a foreign, uh, um, uh, a, a foreign minister's meeting of uh, the ASEAN. And uh, while they, they, uh, uh, they uh, tell all parties in Myanmar to uh, exercise uh, restraint, I have to say that uh, ASEAN countries are also not uh, united in uh, condemning uh, the coup d'etat and uh, uh, also uh, uh, demanding the release of Aung San Suu Kyi. Of the 10 ASEAN uh, countries, uh, for example, I think it's only Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, and Singapore that uh, called for uh, the release of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. So I would, I would say that uh, the response of ASEAN thus far has been very disappointing, uh, but but uh, I I also I also need to note that uh, uh, given how ASEAN works, I mean in terms of consensus building, uh, not uh, discussing uh, uh, controversial issues in public. Uh, uh, the emphasis on uh, saving pace, uh, among others. Uh, I, I mean, this is to be expected from the ASEAN. Mm -hmm. But it's at least disheartening to see that Indonesia, which is, after all, the biggest uh, and politically most important country in ASEAN, is continuing its role as sort of the, the leader of ASEAN and tries mm -hmm. to push it yeah. into a more um, proactive role. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that ASEAN is also divided, uh, that um, some countries especially follow um, follow very much uh, China's yeah. dictate. Now, in Latin, to bring the discussion a little bit um, also to um, parallels with Latin America, uh, there's a growing um, investment of China in various Latin American mm -hmm. countries, also a stronger political engagement, a stronger mm -hmm. diplomatic engagement. Uh, tellingly, of course, especially strong in our authoritarian countries like Venezuela and Nicaragua, but also in quite a few others. Um, and when you look at the way China exerts its commercial influence um, into and goes into the political sphere, how worried should we be in this region? How harmless or how problematic is growing ch Chinese involvement? <laughs> Does it come with strings attached? Well, definitely, Sigi, it comes with strings attached, as uh, the cases of Sri Lanka, Cambodia, even the Philippines uh, would show. Uh, and um, I, I have to say that developing countries, whether in Asia or Latin America, should really be uh, concerned about uh, how China is uh, trying to connect uh, its uh, economic power with, uh, with influence in uh, politics in, in these uh, uh, countries. Uh, we can see it clearly, for example, in uh, Cambodia and, and uh, the Philippines. Uh, so, so the reason why uh, ASEAN is also uh, divided on, on the issue is also because of China. Uh, China is pulling the strings in uh, some of the countries uh, within uh, ASEAN. And uh, because of that, China, uh, ASEAN is losing its uh, credibility, particularly among uh, democracy uh, activists. In, in that, uh, 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 in, in that uh, a webinar we uh, sponsored last uh, Sunday with uh, Myanmar democracy activists, she was telling us that she does not uh, believe that anything would come out of the ASEAN, primarily because of China. 
so 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 uh, the democracy activists in the region they they look uh, at uh, uh, China as the puppet uh, master uh, behind uh, the ASEAN. Uh, in terms of uh, investments and official development uh, uh, assistance in many countries in the region, um, I, I have to say that um, um, this is also China's way to uh, exercise its uh, control and, and, and power uh, over developing countries. And we should really, really be worried uh, of this, uh, of this uh, economic uh, enticements. In Asia, we have this uh, AIIB, we have this Belt and Road uh, Initiative, and many countries uh, uh, embark on this without much thinking. So I think in the long run, they're going to regret this. Mm -hmm. There was a, to take, uh, to take this a bit further, um, there have been a lot of promises from China to the Philippines. Um, mm -hmm. How much has actually materialized and how generous are the terms of China's actual um, yeah, investment or support? Yeah, yeah. actually in the, in the Philippine context, there has been a debate uh, about it uh, recently because some, some people are claiming that in terms of, uh, let's say, development assistance, other countries are giving more in actuality uh, like China is good in making promises, but uh, in terms of actual delivery, um, uh, many of these uh, promises are not uh, materializing. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, Japan, for example, has been much, much more consistent in terms of uh, loans, uh, in terms of aid. Um, so, so uh, well, th this is something to, to take uh, in, into account uh, as well. Um, but, but I also have uh, to point out uh, that, that uh, in the case of Myanmar, since, since we are focusing on Myanmar, uh, on, on paper, uh, they, they, they say that Japan is the largest uh, investor, uh, but, but uh, uh, many suggest that it was actually China. And that's why um, wh when the coup d'etat happened, uh, many, many, uh, uh, many people are urging China to take uh, a more uh, proactive role. Uh, but so far it has not materialized. And uh, China, for example, considered the Myanmar coup d'etat as a mere cabinet uh, reshuffle. Uh, so, so that's really a cause for concern as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have seen also in places like Sri Lanka that uh, getting deeply in debt with China can be um, can be a very very dangerous very dangerous exercise. Mm -hmm. um, you alluded to something that I would like to deepen a, a bit more, namely that China is playing in a way. Uh, uh, a risky game in the sense that uh, some of the things it does uh, might provoke um, serious backlashes. Yeah. For example, there's a widespread criticism that um, Chinese investment usually also comes with masses of Chinese workers, so that when mm -hmm. they implement the project, they don't hire locals, they bring in their own workers from China. And this is in the context of Southeast Asia, where in most countries, maybe with a exception to some extent of the Philippines, there's a long tradition of anti-Chinese resentment and um, yeah, of clashes between Chinese minor ethnic minorities in those countries and the majority. Um, and you, you alluded or you mentioned that Xi Jinping is actually yeah, you are trying to instrumentalize to some extent uh, the ethnic yeah. Chinese who have of course been living since decades or centuries in, in these countries. Um, so maybe we could talk a little bit about that, that this is actually creating, might, might be creating real problems for ethnic Chinese in the region. That, that, that's true. Uh, although I have to say, uh, Sigi, that uh, we, we have to be more uh, nuanced uh, about it. Um, so for example, uh, in the case of uh, Philippines and uh, Thailand, um, economic uh, dependence uh, 
is a contributing factor, I would say, uh, on this particular issue. So in the Philippines, there's not uh, uh, much uh, support from uh, the Filipino-Chinese community to China. And uh, I, I think that's uh, primarily because uh, their business interests are not necessarily tied uh, to the mainland. Uh, but in the case of uh, Thailand, uh, what I observe is uh, despite, um, despite the political, uh, uh, the, the political uh, changes, uh, the changes in leadership uh, through the years in the past two decades or so, China policy of Thailand has been relatively consistent. A and uh, some say that this is primarily because of the domestic constituency in Thailand uh, supporting uh, a greater uh, uh, involvement of Thailand with uh, ma mainland uh, China. Uh, but yes, uh, I, I, I have to say that China is also uh, cunningly using uh, uh, race, uh, religion, uh, in order to foment uh, uh, a dissent uh, in, in many parts of uh, Asia, uh, if they think that this descent would be to their advantage. Yeah. Um, we have now talked a little bit about uh, China's more aggressive policy in the neighborhood. One could even talk about the sort of um, stronger military posture towards Taiwan, but also in the South China Sea. Um, but it's also, of course, something that happens within China. I mean, the space for dissent and for debate within China has uh, narrowed dramatically under Xi Jinping. Um, and he has taken, so he has basically taken China on a significantly different course um, that um, probably uh, is not liked by everybody in China. Um, to what, maybe we can talk a talk a little bit about this, how sustainable is that? Um, isn't Xi Jinping uh, taking also a risky gamble? I, I think in the long run, uh, Sigi, you're, you're, you're correct. That, um, I mean, by, by uh, swinging China to the authoritarian direction, uh, too much, I have to say, um, it would uh, eventually create uh, a backlash. And, um, this is happening already in, in many countries in the region, as I pointed out. But uh, uh, we, we, can, we can also uh, surmise that maybe uh, uh, domestically, uh, this uh, dissent would also uh, lead to, to something uh, bigger in, in the future. Um, and I was talking to uh, Emily Lau of Hong Kong and um, she, she had connections with uh, human rights uh, lawyers uh, inside uh, China. And uh, she was telling us that they were really, really dissatisfied with how uh, Xi Jinping is um, uh, 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 using his uh, power uh, to, to uh, more or less uh, 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 control dissent no, within, uh, within uh, the country. Uh, so, so they're currently underground at the moment uh, because uh, for, for, for obvious reasons, they would be arrested if they come out in, in the open. But, but you're correct, Sigi, that, that uh, something is brewing uh, inside uh, the country. And uh, uh, maybe what we can do as uh, democracy activists is to nurture these uh, relationships with these people within, uh, within China, because uh, without a doubt, they also need our, our support. Um, uh, they're, they're being perse persecuted, they're working underground, and uh, well, if we want to bring democracy to China, uh, we also need to build a constituency within China. Well, the recent episode with Clubhouse uh, that suddenly <laughs> had an explosion of debate uh, from, from mainland Chinese uh, shows that there is probably quite a bit of suppressed demand for that. But how, um, but yeah, um, 
when that will manifest itself is everybody anybody's mm -hmm. guess. I think looking at the time, uh, we should open the floor to questions. We have, um, I'll explain it in Spanish quickly. Um, es también el tiempo para la participación. So this is the moment when we, the audience can ask their questions. So we have two. De Olivier el, uh, el Mano, uh, virtualmente, o de uh, escribir su, su pregunta en el in the chat. Um, entonces, um, es, el micrófono está abierta para ustedes. Sí, María Cristina Marón. Um, estás, uh, están en mute, está en mute. Necesita abrir su micrófono. Actually, well, thank you very much, Professor Arlegui. I enjoy very much your 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 conference, and um, actually, I quite familiar with your country. I took my master in Philippine history Ooh. at UP Diliman yeah. a little far ago <laughs> in the time. <laughs> So I'm, I'm familiar with your country and with all Southeast Asian countries. Actually, I would like to ask you if you can explain us how far in history democracy was established in Southeast Asian countries. Well, uh, well, thank you for that question. It's not an easy question to answer. No, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I, I have to say. Um, well, by the way, I also studied in the University of the Philippines, and I also taught there for seven years, uh, mm -hmm. both in the Diliman and Los Baños campus. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. Um, so... Whether, whether democracy is uh, ingrained uh, in many Southeast uh, Asian political system, I, I, I have to say that there is uh, uh, a great uh, diversity uh, among uh, uh, countries in Southeast Asia. I can only speak, uh, I think, uh, uh, in, in the case of the Philippines, but probably you already know this as a history major, uh, so, so in the case of the Philippines, uh, well, uh, after our liberation from uh, Spain, uh, our first constitution mm -hmm. is a democratic constitution. So, so, so I, I would say that uh, democracy uh, really has a, has a strong. Uh, uh, a strong uh, historical um, uh, connection uh, 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 in the case of um, uh, the Philippines. Uh, in, in, in other countries, because, uh, well, many Southeast Asian countries were, were colonies. Uh, some say the, the only exception would be Thailand, uh, but maybe Sigi could uh, explain more. Um, but but uh, I, I have to say that... Um, uh, the, the system that we see now in many countries in uh, East and Southeast Asia, uh, they were only established uh, maybe 30, 40 years ago, starting uh, the 1980s. Uh, many countries prior to that period uh, were authoritarian countries until the third wave of democratization, which uh, started uh, uh, in the late uh, 1970s to the 1980s. So, so, so this uh, wave of democratization so transformed many countries in the region, such as, uh, well, the Philippines, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, to become uh, what they are today. Uh, but as I presented in my uh, presentation uh, a while ago, in Southeast Asia, many countries uh, cannot be considered as uh, true democracies. Um, actually, uh, democratic countries in, in the region are labeled as democracy with adjectives uh, in the sense that 
we are called elite democracy, cacique democracy, uh, among uh, others. So, so there's always a qualification on, on, on the type of democracy that, that, that we have. Um, so, so, well, I, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, but maybe Sigi could, uh, could elaborate more uh, on, on this particular matter. I think um, what you said is correct. Is I, I fully agree with that. One could point out that um, the former British colonies, Malaysia, Malaysia had a relatively strong democratic phase after its independence um, in 1957, um, and then we had towards a more auto autocratic model. And Singapore, while being relatively authoritarian, has always allowed at least uh, free elections. They made it difficult for the opposition to campaign, but the election itself. Um, was generally free because Lee Kuan Yew did tolerate a certain degree of opposition. So in the, uh, Thailand indeed was a, was a latecomer, I think, uh, the, um, the, even though it was never a, demo, um, a colony, it still um, yeah, was very late in developing um, yeah, democratic, democratic structures. So yeah, that's what I would I would add. And Indone Indonesia again, um, after a brief democratic phase after independence, veered into autocracy and then came back only in the third wave. Um, and like you said, uh, clientelistic structures um, in in countries that are still that were still economically relatively poor explain quite a bit. I mean, when we look at the successful democracies in Asia, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. But they are also the economically more prosperous ones. So that connection between prosperity and democracy to some extent holds. Singapore is a bit of a special case because after all, it's just one city. Sigi, I, I, I want to raise another point. Uh, the, the role of the military in, in many uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries, because uh, I think that's an issue which also uh, resonates with, with uh, Latin America. So in many uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, like after the colonization, uh, the military uh, uh, became the, the strongest, most stable institutions. And, that, and, 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 and for that reason, uh, the military was inherently politicized, if I can put it that way. Uh, so there is this um, uh, propensity for the military to be involved in, in politics. And we can see that in Indonesia, in Thailand, in, in Myanmar. Um, so, so maybe this is also something to, to, to take into account when we talk about uh, the historical background of uh, these countries. To what extent the strength of the military contributes to the lack of democracy? Uh, uh, and it can be uh, something that's also relevant to, to Latin America, as I pointed out. Yeah. I think especially in places like Myanmar and Thailand, uh, the military really, the self-perception was that it embodied the national ethos, which, um, mm. and they derive a, um, a demand to have a special role in society. Mm. That's, I think, really a very problematic thing. The, in Latin America, I think the situation has changed a bit. Uh, that the military has moved away from its once dominant position, but it's still behind the scenes a very, very important player, even in countries like Mexico that have been um, civilian run throughout. Okay, mm -hmm. otras preguntas, comentarios. Um, since no one is, uh, ah, no, Bata. Bata Pantoja. Oh, no, sorry. Um, Jose Hernandez Prado. <laughs> yes, thank you. Congratulations, Lita. A wonderful chat that you gave us. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we, we have learned a lot about, about your countries, about this situation. I cannot help thinking uh, that much of this has happened because of Trump, because mm. of the... Uh, uh, Trump era. So now that we can, uh, Joe Biden, uh, the presidency of the United States, now that the world is changing in that well, uh, uh, in that well situation, I, I would say 
uh, what do you think about uh, these uh, concerning this situation that you described us uh, uh, in Myanmar or uh, in Hong Kong? Is there any chance that these new winds in the world can affect uh, positively this, this, this situation that you have, have talked about, uh, about that to us? Do you think that? Yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, the United States has a role to play. But, but I have to say, in relation to Myanmar, for example, mm -hmm. I would say that the role is quite limited. Um, the United States uh, in, uh, imposed targeted uh, sanctions uh, um, against uh, the uh, Myanmar uh, generals. Uh, but the United States cannot do it alone. It has, uh, it needs the support of other allies uh, in the region. And I would say particularly Japan yes. and uh, even India uh, with regard to uh, Myanmar. On its own, it would have very limited clout uh, to, to the current uh, regime in uh, Myanmar. And, and, and for, for that reason, uh, many people are claiming that uh, this uh, Myanmar uh, stalemate would continue for quite a long time, that this is going to be a protracted struggle um, because, um, uh, well, Myanmar, uh, the, the Myanmar military, the Tatmada, would not give up power. That's what many analysts analysts. Uh, are, are, are saying. Um, very few countries have enormous clout on, on the Myanmar military. Uh, so, so it's unlikely for them to give up power due to sanctions. Um, so, so it's going to be a long struggle. And it's really, I mean, it really pains me to say that uh, because uh, in the past days, uh, we're seeing an escalation of violence. And uh, many people are dying. Many people are being yes. imprisoned. Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, sorry that it's going to continue, <laughs> most likely. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Not what you told us, but to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Lito, since there's no immediate question, I would like to add something, uh, to add a question to um, what you just said, namely that um, America has to act more in concert with um, regional allies. And we see the emergence of a so-called what, um, mm. an informal, let's say an informal alliance of Japan, India, Australia, and, mm. um, and the US, um, that, which, also, uh, which also includes a relatively strong military component, not a formal alliance, but uh, an increased, um, cooperation, joint exercises. Just now, Japan and the US are having joint exercises. Um, but they exercise with India and with Australia regularly. And but many people don't know each of these countries. India, Japan, and uh, Australia all have, at the moment, something like 40 new major warships under construction each, mm. um, which is a, a reaction to, of course, the growing Chinese maritime presence. And we have the flashpoint, we have two serious flashpoints, Taiwan and the South China Sea, where uh, China is pushing yeah, uh, territorial claims that no one that uh, no one in the world supports and that the international uh, law of the sea doesn't support. Um, how worried should we be? How, how big, do, you're, you're closer, how big is the risk of something going wrong, going badly wrong? <laughs> um... Well, I, 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 I hate to be really pessimistic, Sigi, but, but that, that's why I ended my presentation with, with a positive note. Uh, but, but, but I have to say, um, I, I, I don't see immediate change from happening, uh, even given the, the victory of Joe Biden. Um, I, I think China was able to establish itself uh, uh, really uh, strongly in, in uh, the region and also in other parts of the world. 
uh, for example, even the, the, the even in Europe, right? They cannot immediately dispense uh, the relationship with uh, China, um, and, and and for that reason, some are are are, are saying that. Uh, well, Joe Biden may have a difficult time uh, organizing this global summit for democracy if it will uh, focus on criticizing China, because uh, even among his allies in, in Europe, uh, you'll see hesitance to uh, antagonize uh, China. Um, but... but uh, I, I, I want to be positive, Sigi, and, and uh, looking at uh, the democratics in the, 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 the democratic movements in, in the region, I have to say that I'm really inspired with what the Hong Kong people are doing, with what the Myanmar people is, uh, are, are doing. I, I don't think they believe that they would, they would eventually triumph. Um, but they still continue to do what they do. And that's really inspiring. Uh, as I said, we have to continue to pound the rock, even if we, 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 we are aware that it, it may not break within our lifetime, but we, con we, we should continue the pushback. I mean, there's no other way. I think that's actually a pretty good closing statement, I would add that this is something we should also take away for Latin America, because when you think that this milk, and I would invite everybody to look a bit more at this milk tea alliance, it's really a fascinating new movement that sprung up between countries that don't share a common language like most of Latin America does. Um, it's happening in English, but yet um, it has been uh, a movement that has had a, a real impact and that has created, I would say, um, an embryonic regional sense um, that the, the, the health of democracy or the future of democracy in one country depends on the others. Mm -hmm. Something we obviously we have seen in both our regions um, that democratization that happened in one country had effects on others. We have seen a wave of uh, democratization in Latin America in the past um, and we have seen that in Asia after the Itza revolution in the Philippines. So I think what we're seeing now is a sort of reincarnation of that um, spirit and I think that is something we need to take a stronger look at in Latin America as well. That uh, we need to build stronger alliances um, among Democrats across, uh, across uh, borders. Would you agree to that? So thank you very much um, for this really enlightening uh, and fascinating talk. And I hand over to Silvia Mercado, our coordinator of Elial, for the closing statement. Silvia, you have the floor. Muchísimas gracias, sí. Muchísimas gracias, Elito. De verdad, eh, un lujo tenerte con nosotros en tu mañana y en nuestra noche, porque a través tuyo una vez más tenemos las lecciones de Asia hacia América Latina y también personalmente las lecciones de Cult hacia Relial, ¿no? Siempre es una lección de, de solidaridad, una lección de, de compañerismo, de entender cómo una, una región tan distinta, América Latina, puede tener similares... Eh, Dificultades, problemas. Very interesting to, uh, to fi find out how a region which is so. Vamos a aprender más, queremos conocer más sobre las circunstancias. Y en esto, muchas gracias, Sigi, porque una vez más eres nuestro puente de América Latina hacia Asia. También nos acercaste a, a Taiwán, trayendo a la, a la ministra Tang, y eso nos abre mucho los ojos. O sea, con, para Relial es muy importante que América Latina tenga una perspectiva más amplia, ¿no? Para poder ver nuestros problemas desde otro punto de vista. Entonces, eh, sobre todo, esto, eh, un agradecimiento profundo porque esta primera experiencia de, eh, virtual nos da posibilidad para hablar de otros temas. Eh, quiero agradecer también a los profesores José Hernández Prado de la, de la UAM, acá en una universidad aquí en México, y a la profesora María Cristina eh, Barrón de la Ibero, Profesores interesados en los temas eh, que, que ahora tocamos sobre Asia y también sobre los temas de la libertad, ¿no? Que tanto nos conciernen ahora. 
Y bueno, eh, hay muchas cosas que, que quisiera eh, sacar, pero realmente la, la plática y el intercambio con Sigue han, han dado mucha luz para otros temas que podríamos seguir tocando en otros conversatorios. Quiero resaltar el tema de la solidaridad que se, que se advierte dentro de Cal, dentro de los países. Me gustó mucho el mensaje con el que cierra Celito, esto de, de, de entender también la libertad como una inspiración constante. Ciertamente las campañas que vimos de los paraguas en, en, en Hong Kong, el Sea Milk y el Bee Water, ¿no? nos dan ideas de que tenemos que ser muy creativos para defender las, nuestras ideas y pues defender las vidas, porque ya, ya no es solamente un lema, ¿no? Hay vidas en riesgo, las noticias que nos traes son muy cercanas, están, acaban de suceder el fin de semana, entonces eh, nos, nos llama mucho la atención el, el nivel de, de violencia, pero al mismo tiempo, al mismo tiempo el, el, el optimismo que traes y la inspiración que nos dejas, entonces... Muchísimas gracias una vez más. Eh, habrán otras de estas conversaciones. Estamos ya salvando la barrera del lenguaje. Entonces, esta es una, una de otras cuantas que vamos a seguir invitando. Muchísimas gracias, Brenda, contigo. Sí, solo para cerrar, muchas gracias nuevamente a Silvia, a Sigui, a Celito y a los participantes por estar el día de hoy acompañarnos en este evento. No me queda más que agradecerles a todos y... Buenas noches o buenos días, depende en donde estén. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Bye. bye. Uh, thank you, Nito. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you.